the world's tallest and most powerful single drop waterfalls all to yourself or to your group, or having immersive and meaningful interactions with our indigenous peoples without an interpreter because our primary language is English. The tourism sector in Guyana continues to be one of the eminent growing sectors and it is on the rise. Unlike gold or oil and gas, tourism is not an extractive industry. This means that tourism has the potential to outlive the extractive sectors as it will continue to provide economic, social and conservation benefits over the long term. With a landscape that is diverse in its offerings and large largely undeveloped. Ghana offers a wealth of natural and cultural heritage, uh, cultural and heritage attraction to travelers and prime opportunities to investors looking to engage in new business initiatives and ventures in tourism and the hospitality sector. The Ghana Tourism Ministry has demonstrated success and commitment to maintain the authenticity of its attractions, fostering an attractive platform for investors looking to cater to the growing number of experience-based travelers Ghana's excellent natural resources and strong cultural heritage allows for ecotourism, nature, adventure, and cultural tourism to flourish as its main tourism motiva motivations. Tourism contributes significantly to Ghana's economy, and government is committed to working with investors who share common objectives and interests that aid in their vision of Ghana's low-carbon development path. In addition to the government's, the strong government's commitment, their long-term positive outlook and being the country, the only country in South America whose official language is English, there are a number of reasons to consider investing in sustainable tourism in Guyana. Um, Dr. Uh, Ramster would have actually highlighted you know, quite a bit of what, what we're doing and gaining recognition for. So, Ghana is actually in the global spotlight, but not only thanks to oil and gas or the fact that it is the fastest growing economy in the planet, increasingly Ghana is being recognized for what it does best, protect and promote its natural and cultural heritage. So much so that in 2019 alone, Ghana received six international awards, including being named the number one best in ecotourism destination in the world, and one of the top 10 sustainable destinations by ITB Berlin the Green Destinations Foundation, and the Best in Sustainable Tourism by the Latter Foundation. We continue to receive these international recognitions in 2020, and just recently actually winning the best video in the Stay Safe category in 2021 at the ITB Now trade show. Being recognized as a leading sustainable destination is both a great honor and a great responsibility. The tourism sector is committed to remaining among the best of the best by integrating sustainable destination management and development best practices into our strategy, policy, planning, product development, regulations, training, and promotions. This is just one of the top reasons to invest in Guyana's tourism sector. And you might be wondering what are some of the others? So I'm gonna uh, take you through just the top 10 reasons um, starting off with the travel and tourism industry injected 69.9 billion directly into Ghana's economy in 2019. And this figure is actually based on the analysis from the visitor exit motivation survey that's being done by the Guyana National Bureau of Statistics, which estimates that the average visitor spend per traveler per visit was 222,216. Based on the indirect and indu induced economic impacts, the actual economic value of the sector is much greater. This includes the sales, income, and jobs in other sectors that supply goods and services to the tourism sector, and increased sales from household spending of the income earned in tourism and supporting sectors. For example, hotel employees spend their income on housing, utilities, groceries, etc. Number two, tourism is the second largest export sector in Ghana before oil. Based on the Bank of Ghana annual 2019 report, tourism is among the top five export earning sectors in Guyana, overshadowed only by gold. In 2019, tourism earned 69.9 billion, topping rice at 47.8 billion, bauxite at 27.3 billion, and timber at $7.2 billion. Travel and tourism contributes to an estimated 22,000 jobs in Guyana. Travel and tourism accounts for one of every 11 jobs globally. 
In Guyana, it employs 13,300 people and contributes to 22,000 jobs through direct and indirect means. This includes everyone from guides, tour operators, taxi cabs, drivers to restaurant wait staff, and local artisans and farmers. The total contribution of tourism, travel and tourism to Ghana's GDP is estimated to be 7.8%. And this is based on the direct contribution um, as a percentage of Ghana's total GDP for 2019. Ghana received 314,747 total visitors in 2019, which accounts for a 9.8% increase. And in 2018, we would have had increase of 15.9%. And just before COVID hit January to February 2020, our increase was uh, recorded at 17%. They anticipated that with great effort to support the strong recovery of the sector, Ghana will attract more than 500,000 visitors as early as 2025. Guyana received of that total, I would have just mentioned, Ghana received 231,881 visitors specifically for leisure travel in 2019, which accounts for 8.79% increase over the previous year. And this is huge. It shows that more than 50% of the visitors coming to Guyana for nature, culture, adventure, and other tourism experiences like our festivals and events. Conservatively, the average visitor expenditure per traveler per visit is estimated to be 222,216. And this is based on an analysis that was done by the Bureau of Statistics in 2018. And this is actually on par with what UNWTO would have estimated the average visitor spend um, worldwide. Tourism contributes to Ghana's low carbon green economy agenda and all 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. The UN, WTO and their member states have formally recognized the actual and potential contribution of the tourism sector to accelerate the achievement of all 17 SDGs due to the sector's direct and multiplier effect on other sectors. This means that well-managed tourism provides economic benefits that help protect the environment and cultural heritage. Travel and tourism investment in Ghana is projected to increase to 7.7 .7 billion by 2028. Tourism is shortlisted as a priority investment sector in Guyana, and, that, and this here is the very reason why. An increasing number of local and international visitors see the opportunity. Not only do they foresee monetary returns, but they know that their investments will have a positive impact, which is priceless. Tourism is an export sector and the policy environment is improving as Dr. Uh, Ramster would have uh, explained early on, um, you know, and Go Invest, the GTA, GRA with our partner tag, or, actively working or closely with one another to improve the general duty-free concessions and incentives that are offered to encourage tourism investment. Um, with recent policy changes like the removal of VAT from hinterland travel, building and construction materials, electricity, etc. So the accommodation range right now in Guyana um, is extensive. Um, it includes resorts that are very rustic, um, hotels, rentals, lodges, guest houses, bed and breakfast, uh, basically. But there is much need um, for a lot more. As Dr. Ramster would have mentioned, you know, there is a target that we're trying to hit for the next five years to create 2,000 additional rooms as it stands in 2019, we had 3,800 rooms. Um, and that would have ranged between nature resorts that are found in uh, the river, uh, river and areas, in the savannas, boutique hotels, uh, rentals, guest houses, et cetera. Overall, this increase can be cre uh, credited to renovations, expansions, and or the addition of new properties Despite these increases prior to COVID-19, lodges in the Rupununi were often booked out one year in advance. And we were getting a lot of uh, complaints that there were not enough rooms in the capital city. This clearly indicates that there is a need and demand for more rooms. Um, in terms of our asset inventory, just drilling down a little more into those uh, figures that I would have just shared. 
Um, a further look into the accommodation sector would indicate that there are a total of 29 resorts with 328 rooms, 114 hotels with 200, sorry, with 2,013 rooms. Um, and then of course, uh, as Dr. Ramsey would have mentioned, through EOIs, we would have received expression of interest valued more than 1 billion US dollars. And it just reinforces um, you know, the confidence in the country and in the tourism sector. Just sharing a little bit of what, what that demand looks like or have been based on uh, key data analysis that we would have had over the past couple of years. Over the last five years, Ghana recorded over 1.1 million visitors. And those visitors were mainly from the Caribbean, US and Canada. 33% of those mentions were from the diaspora and 62% were in the nationals. The main purpose of visit was holiday and business and uh, visiting friends and, and friends were the top three reasons for that. Um, and again, in 2018, it was established that the average visitor spend was 222,216 Ghana dollars. Based on our projection, it is estimated that we could reach 500,000 by 2025, and that was actually our original target. However, due to COVID, um, the pandemic, and the recovery timeline, this figure may be adjusted uh, a little bit um, in that regard. Source market. So uh, what are the flight connections we have right now? So, and, and this obviously affects the potential growth. So we have really good air connections with the US market, um, the Caribbean. Uh, one of the things that the Chadi Jagan International Airport and the GTF are, are actively working on is attracting new airlines to Ghana, especially to connect Guyana directly to the European markets. Um, and the reason that's important is because European travelers are very much aligned with the Guyana tourism product and what we have to offer. So it's important that we continue to work um, towards achieving this goal. Um, another important part to recognize in terms of what that demand is. So I've been talking about international travelers, but there is that great opportunity as well for the domestic market and understanding the Guyanese traveler is, is key um, to um, helping you make a decision as to what these investments should look like. Um, visitor profile, it's you know any age, obviously a resident of Guyana, the duration of tours, they're mostly attracted in day tours um, and their um, percentage of overnight is, is not as, as long as that of an international traveler. Um, but why do locals travel? They wanna explore, they wanna learn more about their country, they're looking for recreation um, and they're looking to do that as well with their family. How are they, what are the influence and factors and how they receive information through word of mouth, family and friends, of course, social media. Of course, uh, developing this market or reaching this market is not without challenges. Um, product market alignment, cost is a very big factor, but we know that a lot of the infrastructure work that is going to be happening over the next five years is going to address quite um, a bit of uh, these challenges. And then of course, obtaining information and support from residents and other stakeholders, including private and public sector. So I think all the speakers before me would have alluded to the fact that Guyana is open for investment and I would have touched on what those key investment opportunities are focusing on hotel accommodation, luxury eco um, and resorts. But there are other areas as well that talks about uh, camps as well as apartments, joint ventures with indigenous communities, the aviation and transport sector, nature and adventure. We market ourselves um, as, as a country that offers those, those experiences, but there's still quite a bit of gap that needs to be filled with regards to the actual activities and experiences like amusement parks, zip lining, white water rafting, etc. And then of course, tour operations, they're, they're just a handful of tour companies in Guyana. So this is definitely um, an area that uh, we can see investment as well. I'm just drilling down a bit, and this actually would have been in the handbook that you would have received, but just wanted to reinforce, um, if you're looking for the hospitality, uh, hotel sector for luxury branded hotel, we're looking to investors to do that in region three and four. We know that there's gonna be an expansion of the economic activity in these regions, uh, which will spur the need for increased accommodations. And for resort, uh, lodge sector, we're looking at region two, three, four, and nine. And the reason those are important is because we are actively working to expand and improve the tourism circuits in these areas. 
Um, for resort and lodge, um, I think right now Ghana's model, uh, which you know has I think really placed us on the map uh, as a sustainable destination, where communities are actually owning and managing their lodges um, and their tour experiences and tour enterprises. However, that is not the only formula that can work for Guyana. There's quite a lot more. And I've just really highlighted um, three here that you know, is, is also used and would be encouraged, which is the traditional tourism rental agreement model, the public-private partnership community takeover model, and then of course, the community tourism mi minority uh, ownership and private sector management model. Um, and I'm not going to go into these details, but just wanting to um, share that, you know, there are existing concessions, but they're also being done based on the EO right now, based on the impact, etc. Those concessions are being reviewed on a case by case basis. So again, the enabling environment to encourage tourism is definitely improving. Um, and just to end off, I think, you know, we're still very cognizant that we are in the, uh, we're still in the midst of the COVID pandemic, but Ghana is well positioned for traveling the new norm. Vast open spaces, no crowds, small group tours, small eco lodges, and low population density really does put us with a competitive advantage. So I want to end off by saying Ghana is safe for travel and we are ready for investments. So let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, um, for that presentation. But before I elaborate um, on some of the key highlights that you made, I will invite my next speaker, um, Mr. Sean McGrath, to make his presentation. Uh, Mr. McGrath, he graduated from in 1982 from the Dublin College of Catering with a higher diploma in hotel management and has acquired his Bachelor of Science degree in, from the Trinity College in Dublin. He and um, Paul Stevenson started the Cara Hotel in 1995, which operates Cara Lodge in Guyana and Cara Hotels at the Pointe Pier in Trinidad. He currently serves as a CEO and handles all operational and financial aspects of the company. And he's also a director of Guyana's only destination management company, Wilderness Explorers. And also, um, Sean, he's a founding member of the Tourism and Hospitality Association of Guyana. And he has served about four terms as president and was the driving force behind the creation of Guyana's Restaurant Week and the Guyana Tourism Development Fund. One moment. Development Fund and the Explore Guyana magazine. So without further ado, I would like to invite um, Mr. Sean McGrath to share his success story in the area of hotel development and resort. Thank you very much. Um, everybody can see my screen and hear me? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. All right, great. All right. Well, um, just say good morning to everybody and welcome to this forum. And if what Carla has just told you is not enough to convince you it's time to come and invest in Ghana, let me see what I can do to try and add to, uh, to the, the, the arguments using my experience over the last 30 odd years. Um, uh, Carol Hotels was created by Paul Stevenson and myself um, over 30 years ago. Uh, but we didn't actually come to Ghana initially to invest in Ghana, we came to Ghana to work in Ghana. And both of us came to Ghana as managers of the Ghana Pegasus Hotel. Paul arrived in 1986 and I arrived in 1989. Uh, between that then and leaving in 95, we saw the complete renovation of the, of the Pegasus, the building of the Kingston Wing. And more importantly, we saw the early uh, embryonic stages of ecotourism in Ghana, when we actually built the first purpose-built uh, ecology in Ghana, which was Timberhead built on the Community Creek. Um, and that actually was, sort of, I think that was the first purpose-built resort in the country. Um, and its claim to fame is actually that it, it had uh, Queen Elizabeth II I went there with Prince Philip and members of the royal delegation, the royal party, when they came to Ghana back in 1985. Um, Paul and I were uh, supposed to leave Trust House 40, and um, I was going to the Middle East and Paul was going to Moscow. But we decided at that stage that, no, that we saw a big future in Ghana, and we saw that there was potential there for the development of hotels, the sales sector, the tourism sector in Ghana. So we decided to stay. Um, we opened our first property in 1995. With the 15 bed motel called Car Suites at the time. That operated in a leased building, and we were there until 2013 when we gave when we gave it up. In 1996, we opened Carol Lodge, 
which is actually his house in probably one of the one of the oldest wooden buildings in Georgetown, uh, home to the first Lord Mayor of Georgetown. It's been graced over the years by the presence of royalty, rock stars, and the movie Heartthrobs. Um, started off in 1996 as a small property with 12 rooms, um, but we expanded in 2006 because we saw the need and growing numbers to 34 rooms where we currently are. Um, over the last few years, and particularly things in the oil and gas sector really came in, uh, we have seen occupancy levels grow dramatically in the last number of years. So, and not just another thing, this is across the hotel sector in Ghana in general. Occupancy levels are up, average rates are up. So we've actually decided that we're actually looking at expanding Car Lodge um, to deal with this new demand that is there. Um, in August of 21, we're opening a new annex to the hotel, which will provide one bedroom suites um, to cater for the growing demand of service, long-term self, uh, self-catering accommodation in Guyana, uh, which is predominantly to fit into the oil and gas sector. Uh, and we're also currently developing plans to expand the hotel by an additional 40 bedrooms with a rooftop pool and gym, increased banking space and additional parking. And we hope to get this thing off the ground, up and running by mid-2022 uh, or going into late 2022. Um, Predominantly because of what is happening. Um, uh, as Carla said, numbers have been increasing in Ghana. Our visitor arrivals have been increasing over the last number of years. Even before oil and gas came, numbers were going up as, as tourism uh, in Ghana became a more, more viable um, opportunity and a more viable business. And interest in Ghana drew, grew internationally. Um, so we've actually seen a dramatic increase in the number of people coming to Ghana for leisure travel and using Carla Lodge. And that is one of our, 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 our reasons for the expansion plan is not just the oil and gas sector, but is the increase in tourism arrivals as well. Um, just out of note, we also expanded into uh, Trinidad back in 2003, where we, we have a hotel in Point Lisa near the industrial estate, down in Point Lisa's. Um, as I said, Paul and I decided to stay in Ghana because we saw lots of opportunities for the development of the sector. And, uh, and again, this is going back to almost 30 years at this stage. Um, and the question is, well, why, why, what makes Ghana special and why the opportunities? Uh, we actually got involved in Wilderness Explorers, a tour company, um, as partners back in 1997. The company was established in 1994 by a young progressive Australian called Tony Thornton, who had worked with Paul and I at Pegasus. Um, right now, we're Ghana's only destination management company, Ghana's largest tour operator. Um, uh, we offer products uh, in Ghana and across the region, and we specialize in nature, adventure, community, and cultural experiences. Um, and what do we do? Well, what do we do? We sit down and on a daily basis, we do customized um, FITs for Ghana. We do small group departures, multi-travel destinations, specialized bird watching tours, expeditions. Uh, we do a lot of work with um, TV and film crews. We've just finished a, a big shoot with National Geographic and the Disney Channel. We were in Ghana shooting um, some documentaries. Icon movies are coming in and they're actually arriving in Ghana next, next week and they're doing five episodes in Ghana. So we are doing all the handling and the logistics for them on the ground. Um, so we're an all-encompassing company and we've grown over the years as the markets in Ghana have developed and the markets in Ghana have actually improved. Um, but what makes Ghana an interesting place to come to, an interesting, an interesting place to invest your money in and to stay in? Carla's covered a lot, a lot of this in her presentation. I mean, it's, it's, Ghana is just an untouched wilderness. There's not many of them left anywhere in the world. It's a very special destination. Um, we have a healthy population of wildlife. We're known as the land of the giants. We have the giant anteater, the giant river otter. We have the harpy eagle. Like, I mean, the land of the giants, is one of the few places in the world you can actually come and see these type of animals is right here in Ghana. Carla brought up the work that's been done by the GTA and the fact that Ghana has won several international awards for tourism in the last number of years has brought major international recognition to Ghana as a destination. Um, and that cannot be um, understated in any way, shape or form. Ghana is on the map internationally um, and is getting more so as every day goes by. Uh, Ghana has 800 species of birds, one of the best birding destinations in the world. Uh, community-led and owned tourism is one of the most aggressive ways of developing the tourism sector, and Ghana is a leader in the world for doing this. Uh, Carla talked about small numbers. Surprising enough that small numbers are an advantage. Ghana has in one year less tours than Machu Picchu has in a day. Um, and while we want to increase that, uh, our product is always going to be based on small numbers to keep it environmentally friendly. We don't want to kill, kill the goose that is laying the golden egg. So the numbers are always going to be small. They're always going to be in small resorts. 
Um, but that doesn't mean there's an opportunity for us, to, not an opportunity for us to actually grow and develop the sector. Uh, English is our first language, uh, which is a major advantage internationally whenever you're selling uh, tourism. Um, getting to Ghana has been a challenge over the years, but that has, again, has, has, has improved dramatically over the last number of years. Uh, the North American market was limited in many ways, um, but with the introduction of American Airlines and JetBlue and Copa, the, the access to Ghana, the direct flights in the North American market has, reached, has been a dynamic change uh, in what is available for us to sell. We can now go to North America and package Ghana because people, when they, when they go on vacation, they like to travel with recognized carriers. I like to know that if something goes wrong, there's another plane that's going to come and pick them up and knock them stand every three days uh, in the country. So the, the increase in the international carriers out of North America has been a big advantage to Ghana, obviously for the oil and gas and the business sector, but also in terms of developing the, the, the tourism sector as well. Uh, as Carla said, we've always done a lot of business with Europe. Europe has been predominantly our market for the genuine ecotourism visitor. Um, uh, UK, Germany, Scandinavia, probably the biggest of those markets. Um, getting to Ghana from Europe right now does go via Barbados or Trinidad on the Virgin Atlantic of Barbados, or you can go via KLM from Barbados and then Suriname. Uh, we do know that GTA, as Carol said, are actively pursuing additional airlines to fly direct routes from Europe. And we do think when that happens, that's going to open up major opportunities for the development of the sector in Ghana as well. Uh, right, over the years, until we started off in hotels, we then got involved in tour operation. Now we decided, well, let's go the full step and go the full circle. And we actually got involved in uh, the eco-large sections in Ghana. And there are many ways to get involved in tourism, as Carla said, many models. Uh, but I think we actually are partners in probably, probably one of the most unique models of the in Ghana. Uh, at a rainforest lodge uh, and at a uh, canopy, the walkway is owned and managed by a company that is owned equally by, by uh, Sarama Village, Amarindian Village, Rockview Lodge, uh, Irakrama, and Wilderness Flow. So four partners from four different sectors got together and formed a company that actually uh, operate and manage at a rainforest lodge and the Irakrama the Canopy Walkway. It's a new model that, is, that has never been done in Ghana before, but it's proved to be quite successful. Um, ATA started off in 2005 as a hammock camp. There were um, two band hubs where you went in, you slung your hammock, and that was it. Um, but interest, again, as tourism grew and numbers started to grow, it actually has been converted into an eight bedroom, full, fully lodged, eight bedrooms, all on suite bathrooms, full facilities. Uh, some of the shots we have there, that is the walkway. Um, and so it, it, that really has turned around and is, is, is doing very well for us. Um, as numbers increase, and I think um, what is important was said earlier on in terms of improving the, the transportation within Ghana and the developing of the road infrastructure, I think is going to open up Ghana big time to tourism. Uh, we're not the cheapest destination to come to and getting around Ghana can be expensive, but the plans to, to open the road, the road network, I think is going to have a major dramatic impact on tourism uh, countrywide. In the Rupununi in particular, where predominantly um, the major tourism circle exists at the moment. So that being said, uh, we at Cats um, and Atta Lodge, we're actually looking at development plans of doubling the room stock at Atta by 2024. We want to develop additional nature trails for uh, walking and for biking, and we intend to get into biking tours of, of, of the Rupununi. We will actually travel from Eco Lodge to Eco Lodge by bicycle. Um, and we're also looking at building a swimming pool and other facilities to increase the average length of stay. Um, people who come to Ghana on vacation um, generally come in and they're in Ghana for 10 or 12 days. They do the first night in Georgetown, last night in Georgetown, and the rest of it is in the interior. So generally it's, it's one or two nights stay at, 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 at each eco lodge. They may do two nights at Asha, two nights at Rakrama, two nights at Karanambo. Uh, we're actually looking at, uh, at developing a newer market to get people to go to Ghana for three or four days, not necessarily as part of an overall tour, but developing a business for the local market. You want to go down for a long weekend, stuff that you will get that you can actually do when you're there. And things like swimming pools um, and that type of scenario is, is one of the ways we're actually looking at doing that. So that's our development plans for, um, for Atta Lodge over the next number of years. Um, as I said, there are numerous ways of getting into the lodge business in Ghana, and I think everyone should actually seriously consider this. Irokrama is located in a protected area. Rewa is community owned and operated. 
Cerama, award-winning Cerama, community owned and operated. Rockview Lodge is a tourism rental agreement model where the land is rented from the community and, and, and they're involved in the running of it, but it's a private sector operation. And there's a Carnamba Lodge, famous for Deanne McTurk, uh, that is operated on leased land. So private sector business operating on leased land. Most of these lodges are comfortable, but rustic by nature. That being said, there are, vial there are viable opportunities to invest in new properties or indeed partner with existing properties to upgrade and expand their facilities. All of the lodges mentioned are part of the well-established group in any circuit, which is the most established tourism but there are opportunities to open up other areas and to establish new tourism circuits. Uh, GTA are doing a lot of work in Wakapau, Marakabai, and Warapoka. And these areas are full of opportunities to go in and get involved in developing and building of eco lodges and eco resorts, uh, doing it, combining it uh, with uh, the, lo the local Amarillo communities um, and, and, and opening up other sectors of the country, which is badly needed. Uh, the reality of it is um, a lot of the resorts in Guyana over the peak season are full for a lot of the year. They're booked out in advance. And the tour operator in me is saying that sometimes it's actually hard to sell destination Ghana because there actually there is a shortage of rooms in the interior of Ghana. And that's where our tourism product is. So we really need to see an expansion of what is available in the interior to allow us to go out and to develop and bring in the people that want to come into Ghana, but currently cannot come in because there's just enough availability and space to accommodate everybody who wants to come. Um, again, we don't want to overcrowd the Rupinese circuit, so there are opportunities say, in the other regions as well, and GTA are doing a lot of very positive work in getting some of the villages up there ready for tourism. So I would seriously say, look at the opportunity and do it. Obviously, the, when people mention Ghana, you mentioned tourism in Ghana, the first thing you mentioned about is, is Kaitura Falls and Kaitura National Park. It is the jewel in the crown of Ghana tourism, the largest single drop waterfall in the world. And it has conditions created by the fall support, a very unique micro environment with some of the most endemic species that to that area only. We believe as a tour operator, and I personally believe as somebody involved in the sector, this is the ideal location for a flagship resort in Ghana. I, we actually believe that a luxury resort at, at Kaitur would change the entire dynamic of tourism in the, a sector in the way that Rondon Lidge has done for Papua New Guinea, Secret Bay has done for Dominica, and Lapis Reyes has done in Costa Rica. Um, so there's opportunities there. I know Go Invest would look at anything that would, comes to them, National Parks area. We do believe that the, a, a, an eco lodge, a luxury eco lodge at Kaitur National Park really is, is part of the way forward. That being said, there are other areas that are, um, are open for um, discussion and, and operation as well. Uh, one of those areas is the Extensions Area Region 9, and it is the Mapari Wilderness Camp. Um, it is situated about in the Kanuka Mountains. Um, the un uninhabited river flows through wilderness with unrivaled wildlife such as the harpy eagle, the jaguar, and the goliath bird-eating spiders. The land is part of the indigenous community of Takatoka, and they actually are interested in traditional tourism rental model agreement. We're actually speaking to them with some other partners, but the, this is open to everybody who wants to possibly get involved. Uh, it benefits from being an easy addition to what is currently the well-established Rupinini tourism circuit and can quickly add to existing tourism and develop markets. The simple camp currently in use is suitable for intrepid travelers, but a more comfortable lodge will draw broader markets for nature-based tourists. And in reality, it wouldn't take a lot to actually realize a world-class eco-lodge at this thing. I'm going to show you a video now that just shows you what we're looking at in terms of the opportunity and the beauty of Ghana. And this is what people want to see. So have a look at this. And here's the player. Thank you. 
All right, so that is Mepari, one of the possibilities that exists in Ghana for someone to come in and take on board and develop the sector. There are, of course, um, other opportunities along the coast and on the river rain areas of Ghana. Um, I know someone was asking earlier on about um, what happens to the oil and gas people and the expatriates that are coming to live in Ghana over the next hundred years who want to get away out of Georgetown for weekends. Uh, sometimes the river only is too far to go. There are opportunities for, for uh, resorts along the coast. There are opportunities for resorts uh, on, on the Essequibo and the various rivers uh, to develop those, uh, possibly all-inclusive resorts and the luxury aspect of it. So I think uh, although people see Ghana and the resorts as being rustic, there are major opportunities to actually take it to the next level as well. There's always going to be, uh, there's always going to be a demand for rustic. There's also a demand for the luxury aspect of it as well, the all-inclusive. Um, again, I think keeping them small is the way to go. Um, but as I say, like, I mean, I'm 30 odd years here. We've seen opportunities. We've taken advantage of some of them. I would encourage anybody who is, who is looking at Ghana as a possible venue to come, go and talk to Dr. Ramsrup, go and talk to the GTA, go and talk to Go Invest, take the opportunity while it's available. There are some really good incentives available, uh, more so I think that have been available in the years gone by. I can estimate as somebody who's been to their office locally and, and, uh, and, and recently um, to, inv to uh, investigate about what is available and getting a very positive response. So go and talk to them. The opportunities are there, guys. We'd love to see you in Ghana. We are a community of tourism in Ghana. We're not competitors. We're all colleagues. And any development for the tourism sector in Ghana is good for all of Ghana and good for all the tourism sector in Ghana. We look forward to seeing you all in the too distant future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. McGrath, um, for sharing your experience um, in the tourism industry. And I'm sure there's a lot of takeaways that we, we all took note of, and I'm sure the prospective investors can take note of. You, all, you recognize that there is confidence in the tourism sector. The demand is there, not just internationally, um, but domestically. And in your presentation, you also noted that because of the increase in visitors' arrival, um, as a result, Carol Lodge had to, you know, undergo some expansion work. So in summary, basically saying that the demand is there. Um, you also noted that there's a shortage of room within the, the interior regions and there's opportunities along the coastal land, et cetera. So the demand is there. So now Guyana is indeed a location that we all can invest in. Um, so I will go now to Carla. Um, you highlighted why Guyana is an attractive destination for tourism development. And it's notable that the projection for both travel and tourism investment is quite intriguing. And as mentioned, based on the statistics, that it is actually the second largest export sector, the oil and gas sector being one. And I just want to note that, you know, the development of the hotel industry in Guyana, it can sort of complement the oil and, oil and gas sector because it can also seek to promote local economic activity, thus, you know, bringing in revenues, capital investment, and also increasing employment opportunities and other related tourism development product, pro products that can complement um, the hotel industry. Um, so I just want to go straight into the questions um, raised by some of the participants um, at this session. And Carla, I'm going to ask you if you can answer this one. It says here, extractive sectors are often associated with range of serious environmental challenges. How does Guyana intend on ensuring its ecotourism remains sustainable without a loss of diversity? So Carla, can you please answer? Sure. Uh, that's a great question, actually, especially because, you know, we do want increased visitation, but we want to do that in a very sustainable way. So I think one of the very first thing is ensuring that, that, you know, sustainable best practices are ingrained in every sector, not just tourism, looking at uh, sustainable land use management. You know, as uh, I would have, you know, shared earlier, and so did Sean, you know, Ghana is not focused on increasing the volume of travelers. We're more focused on the value each traveler represents and how can we get them, you know, to stay longer, spend more. Um, it is, you know, for that reason, we recognize the travelers that come to Guyana are, are actually interested in authentic nature, culture, and adventure experiences. Um, and they tend to spend longer and spend more than the average leisure uh, traveler. And you know, the interesting thing about them too is that they're more focused 
on the experience and less on the amenities, which are somewhat rustic in our hinterland uh, right now. So it really is a good fit. And more importantly, many of the travelers want to leave a positive impact on the people and places that they visit. So I think being very focused on, you know, who we're marketing to, who we're trying to attract, and then of course, making sure that our uh, product offering matches their needs as well. All right. Thank you very much, Carla. And um, perhaps we have another question. I'm, I'm both um, you and uh, Mr. McGrath can answer. So the question is, how will the government approach of decentralizing tourism so that local regions drive their own tourism strategies and promotion affect prospects for tourism development and the GTA and their TAG efforts? Right, I can probably take the first stab at it and maybe Sean can come in after, but I think what's important uh, to recognize is that the tourism industry is actually, a, it's private sector driven. Um, the government does not invest in uh, any of the tourism businesses, but we do have to create that enabling environment um, to encourage uh, these investments. And I think the support services that GTA provides, and even through the Ministry of Tourism, the Department of Tourism, um, you know, capacity building, et cetera, I think one of the very key things as well is educating our public and on what tourism is and how they can benefit um, before they get into the business of, of tourism. So I think that's, that's very key. Um, and it is actually something that we are doing right now. We're talking about uh, building new circuits uh, within the coast and other key regions, et cetera. Um, but there is a lot of technical support that needs to be uh, put in right now to help set them up for success. Sean? Okay, I was also gonna say in terms of, I know in terms of that the government are setting up at regional tourism committees as well, uh, which is a very positive move or the, uh, the regions actually to determine what they want to do themselves and what direction they want to move forward. I think what's what important, I mean, we as, as wilderness and as a destination management company, one of our roles is in terms of um, assist, uh, some of the communities that actually want to get into tourism. And we, over the many years we've been in operation, we, we've worked with villages like uh, Sprama and we've worked with Riwa to uh, sort of educate them in, in terms of what they need to do to be market ready. Um, a lot of people assume that if you go in and, and you build a resort, people are going to come. Um, but it's, there's more to it than that. When you build a resort, there has to be activities. There has to be something to do when you get to the resort. You're not going to go to the resort for two days and stay in your room for two days. That's not what people are coming to Ghana for, for. They're coming to Ghana for the experience. So we sit down and we will work with some of these communities and find what do you have in your What can you build to create a product that goes with the rooms you actually have? Um, so it's taking the best of their community and getting them to, to fine tune it so that actually it's market ready. That's, that is advantageous to us as a company because it gives us product to sell. But it's also advantageous to them because it gets them to position that when tourists come in and visit their, visit their resort or visit their community, that they're not disappointed. There's something there for them to do, something there to and they walk away knowing more about the community, knowing, knowing more about the people, and having had, in many cases, a life-changing experience. So, I mean, as I said, like, I mean, uh, Tourism in Ghana is very much is a community-based scenario. Um, and as, as we all develop and we all get better, it just, it, every, it, it benefits to everybody across the board. All right, thank you so much, Mr. McGrath. Um, so I have another follow-up question. Um, and I think Mr. McGrath, you can probably answer this because you had elaborated on this in your presentation. Um, so is there a good potential to get business tourists, including oil and gas, international workers in Guyana? to spend more on tourism, either in Georgetown or the outer regions in Guyana? There is actually, and it's funny you should say that because as, as, as the, the, the um, expatriate community grows in Guyana, and I heard a number last night, which kind of, kind of scared me a little bit, actually. I was told by somebody who was uh, involved in, in, in the oil and gas sector in developing countries for years, said that in the next 10 years, we can expect up to 100,000 expatriates to be living in Ghana. Um, and I went, wow. So I mean, these, these people want to be entertained. They want things to do. They want places to go. As I said, like, I mean, you know, uh, sometimes getting into the or our, our, our predominant market right now is, is in the hinterland. Getting to the hinterland can be expensive. It can be time consuming, particularly over the rainy season and with the road conditions. So developing stuff along the coast, developing lodges along the coast, and developing lodges on the river. Uh, there obviously are some already on, on the Essequibo. Uh, there's one or two on the Community Creek, but there is a 
Hike River. There's lots of river rain areas we can actually do. We can actually develop resorts. You can leave work on a Friday afternoon, do two nights, come back on, on, on Sunday evening after work, and it's, it's, you know two or three hours access from Georgetown. Opportunities there to develop that type of scenario, and for that weekend traffic. But there's all that also then just opens up the possibility for people like me and the tour company to sell it as well. Because I mean, the more product we have, the more the more liable, the more opportunities are there to deal with the international visitor. So a lot of stuff along the coast now actually will, will cater for the international visitor, but also cater for the expatriate that is living again and wants something to do over the weekend. So yeah, big right. opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, Carla, um, a question towards you as it relates um, to ecotourism. To ecotourism, what are the top three tourism offerings for such a target in Guyana or in the area within ecotourism? Oh, that's a tough question because you're practically asking me which is my favorite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good question. Um, right now, um, the Rupununi region is actually the heart of our tourism product and actually are the ones that are truly leading in what sustainable travel is, what ecotourism is. So I, I, I can just you know call a few that's, that's doing a really good job. And of course, the community tourism models are, are definitely um, ones I would recommend, which is the Rewa Eco Lodge and the Saram Eco Lodge. And then you have the other NGO um, and private sector model like Irokrama, the Atta Lodge that Sean spoke about, um, and even Karanambo Lodge. A lot of uh, these lodges within the region really do put a lot of effort into conservation of wildlife, protection of uh, culture and heritage. So um, for that reason, I would say that those would be the ones I'd recommend. All right, thank you for that. And I think the last, the last question from the panelists, um, what initiatives been, are being taken to build capacity for management and service provision at the moment? I can take this. Uh, this the big fear with the development of the sector has been in terms of what happens, where are we going to get the people to work in the sector? Um, and, and that answer has been, has been um, bandied around, quite been bandied around for many, many years. The good news is actually is that we're actually developing a hotel and hospitality training school um, right here in Georgetown. I think it's been, it was approved in the last budget. It's been funded by the CDB or one of those international agencies that are helping to fund it. Um, and it's badly needed. Um, a, lot, a lot of the staff is, a lot of the staff we have in Ghana have in-house training. I mean, I know I've spent a long number of years training staff at Carroll Lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, like, I mean, you bring people on board, they've never worked in the sector, they've never been officially trained, and you spend a lot of time and resources and effort in to get them to, to, to a level that, 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 that you're comfortable with them operating on. So that has been a challenge over the years. Um, and with the development of the sector and the opening of all the new hotels and the rest of it, um, the development of the hospitality and training school is, is critical. Um, I think that actually will ease a lot of the burdens. Um, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, I mean, there is a responsibility of investors coming in here to sit down and take the time and the effort to sit down and work with your staff and train your staff and get them to a level that you're happy with them. That could entail bringing in people from overseas to help you. Um, TAG have done some work in the past with CASO. The CASO volunteers have come down and done some on-site. They've gone into in particular hotels and particular lodges and resorts and worked with the staff on short training courses. So there are opportunities there to actually get your staff trained um, through uh, CASO and, and that. But I think the development of the school is going to be a major asset to uh, the overall development of the sector. All right, thank you, Mr. McGrath. And I, I have a final question that I wanna ask about you and also Carla. Uh, we know globally um, due to the coronavirus, the tourism sector was one of the hardest hit, hit sector. And, and I'm sure there are many lessons we can learn um, as a result of the pandemic. And I'm gonna, you know, what measure, you know, has a GTA and also the private sector, because I know you guys work in collaboration. Uh, what system had has you put, did you put in place in terms of the, encourage that, you know, or to promote Guyana, it's a safe um, country to travel to, and largely is a country that, you know, persons can invest. That's a great question, uh, Soprana. I think over the past uh, couple of months, we've really been focused exactly on that. What is it that we can do and need to do to make Guyana a safe place to travel? Um, and I think I can really confidently say at this time that the GTA and the private sector have really done the work 
to be able to say confidently today that Guyana is safe for travel. And the reason I say that is we would have very early on developed hygiene and sanitation protocols for the tourism sector, every component of your business operations. Not only did we develop those protocols, we provided training to um, support that, to help them heighten uh, their protocols at a business level. Um, and then importantly as well, I, we created an inspection um, system to be able to verify that after you've received the training, you've gone through what the recommended protocols are that at the business level, they've adopted and implemented those hygiene and sanitation protocols. So our inspection team, we inspect for that once you meet the criteria and it is verified that you have put those systems in place, that tourism business gets a um, conditional approval, basically saying that you are safe to host guests um, and that you're doing all you can to protect your team and the communities in which you operate in. Um, and then a lot of it has to do with, um, once we've done that, as I said, and uh, quite a lot of business have, have already achieved that. Now, the next thing is, as you know, vaccines are rolling out internationally and people are going to start to travel at least by Q3, Q4 this year, um, our next job is really now trying to maintain uh, that strong marketing effort to make sure that Guyana stays on top of the mind of travelers so that when they do decide to travel, they know that it is okay and safe to travel to Guyana and, and they book a trip here basically. Um, and Sean would have actually gone through uh, our inspection process, so maybe he can uh, come in here as well, but he's very okay with the work that we are doing in the GTA. I can just say, I mean, I'm, what, what the tourism sector has done in, in the COVID era is, is fairly remarkable. And I say that because, I mean, obviously the last year has been, has been a year of webinars and seminars and everyone's been Zooming all over the world. Um, and that actually, I've actually been participating in a lot of uh, webinars to talk about tourism internationally and, and, and problems that tourism countries are having all the rest of it. And I have to say is that when I've gone on and, I've, and people have gone on and they've said what's happening in Ghana, they've seen what's happening in Ghana, Ghana has got a lot of kudos internationally for what actually it's done and, and how rapidly they moved in, how quickly they stepped in to try and get the sector ready. Um, we do have distinct advantages that, that our numbers are small. We have distinct advantages in terms of that the lodges are small. Um, somebody said that social distancing is automatically built into our landscape. Um, and so that is an advantage we have too. But I think the GTA have done um, Trojan work in terms of actually getting the sector ready to reopen and ready to reopen safely. I think we are. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's we, a lot of lessons been learned from COVID. I don't think anyone's going to be the same after this thing goes away. And any business anywhere in the world, I think a lot of lessons have been learned in terms of what was acceptable is no longer acceptable. I think COVID will have increased standards of safety and hygiene across the board that may never have actually happened had it not been for COVID. And that's all very positive stuff. So while it's been a pandemic and it has decimated the sector, I mean, there's no other two words about it. Tourism in Ghana has been decimated in the last year. People are looking forward to reopening. They're ready to reopen. And I think they're going to reopen in a better frame of mind and, 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 and excited about moving forward. So yeah, I mean, it's been a tough year, but the future is looking bright. All right. Um, so, well, I thought I would have asked the last question, but there are some other questions that are rolling and I think we can wrap these up um, very quickly. Um, another question asks is what development incentives are in place for the tourism sector? So I'll let you or Carla decide um, to answer. Well, I think it's go to the, go to the uh, look at the catalog that was sent you. They're all clearly <laughs> listed in the catalog that was there. And I think you, Safana, was probably the best person to answer that question in terms of the incentives that are there. Uh, talk to Go Investor. They're, they're, they're all in writing. Um, they're all there, so I mean, it, it's, I'm, there's no point in running through them line by line. Um, but find the catalogue that was sent here, or the Go Investor sent here, and they're all listed there. Great. All right. Um, so those who are listening, um, you can contact Go Invest. In the chat, they have placed their email and contact information. If there's opportunity that you may want to invest in the tourism sector, you can go directly to them and reach out to them. So without further ado, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude um, to the Guyana Office for Investment, the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies, and the Caribbean Export Development Agency for this timely virtual conference um, on, inv on investment opportunities within Guyana. And of course, we're not just talking about the tourism sector, that it, we, we dealt with hotel and resort development, but also agriculture and forestry, the mining sector, the oil and gas, the logistics and infrastructure. 
as we know, Guyana is one of the fastest growing economies and there's a vast of opportunities that um, our private sector, both domestic and international, we can venture into, you know. So there are opportunities and as mentioned, based on all the presentation, you know, that was given that the reason why we need to invest in Guyana. Also participants, I would, I'm asking you guys to also to fill out a survey that will be sent um, via email um, for this event. So first, so let me bring this session to a close and thank you very much. Thank you, Carla James for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Mr. McGrath as well for the insightful, the, you know, the success story that you, you, that you have shared with us. So again, thank you participants. Thank you all. Thank you, Soprano.